Hi, I'm Neil Kleiman, and uh, I'm interviewing Dr. Manos Berlakis this morning. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Berlakis with us. Actually, Manos, you may not know it, but I'm the one who uh, told him to invite you. Well, thank you. Uh, actually, shortly after we were in China together. Well, thank you very and much. And the reason that we asked Dr. Berlakis to come is uh, that in our book, he is the world expert in opening chronic total occlusions. So, Manos, thank you very much for coming. I know you had a little bit of a difficult time freeing yourself up for this, but we're very fortunate to have you here. And, you know, every time uh, I hear you talk, uh, I, I'm a little flabbergasted because you make so many points that I hadn't thought of, and I learned so much. I always have to wonder, which of these points am I going to be able to remember? And, you know, every year my ability to do that decreases a little bit. So once again, thank you for coming. You've shed a tremendous amount of light on a new field and a field that uh, is very challenging for most of us. So let me ask you a couple of things. How long have you been an interventionalist? So I graduated in 2004. So it's been 12 years. 12 years. And how long have you been uh, interested in chronic total occlusions? We were, I mean, it was interesting from early on. So I remember when I was training, I would be at TCT, and my attendings would say at the time, you know, you see these things, you should never do this. I still remember this this day. But we started doing them early 2005, 2006, and then um, went to TCT, so some of the retrograde cases from, from Japan, and then more on a more full-time 2007 on, it's been, I will be doing them more, more systematically. Okay, so now other than telling us there's a clinical need, it's a new frontier, et cetera, what really got you interested in CTOs? What really happened to you uh, intellectually in 2005, 2006 that made you say, I want to do this? That's a, a great question. It was actually more the challenge, I think. I think it's something that you see and you know that could maybe be done, but it's not, you know, it's very, it may not work. And there's not an easy way to do this. So I think it was a challenge that can this be done or not? I think many of us in the beginning we just we're fascinated by the challenges and the opportunity of getting something to work, and that slowly get us involved. But it was more of a serendipity, I would say. Again, I happened to be at ECT, I happened to be free, I happened to be in some of those sessions, and then I became fascinated and started doing them. Okay, and I'm sure you're not willing to divulge <laughs> the names of the attendings who told you not to do that. I'm not. Okay. <laughs> do I know any of them? You, you sure I'm do. I'm sure I do. <laughs> Uh, so tell me, um, in your weekly or monthly practice, what proportion of the cases you do involve CTOs? So it's about, um, uh, it's grown over time because we have a referral basis right now, but I would say we do about 100 CTOs, about 300 C PCIs a year, about 100 of them are CTOs, about one third. So. Of the PCIs. I mean, if it was so a third of the PCIs, uh, when you say we, cases. do you mean you and uh, your partner, Subhash? Yeah, I mean, we do most of the I mean, we do most of the cases together. Okay. So that's about three a week. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's pretty substantial. Well, you yeah. know, volume is good. I think for these procedures, the more you do, the, the better it gets. What do you do with the other days? Recover from the CTOD. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, you know, we do the full, uh, you know, it's two of us at the, at the Dallas VA, and we do the full spectrum. We do all the diagnostics, we do all the interventions, we do a lot of peripherals as well. Uh, we do some structural, that's more of the mitra, of the tablet, I do more of the mitra clip, but CTO is a big part of, of what we do. Are you in the lab every day? Yes. Okay, great. What about your other responsibilities? How do you balance those? So we're fortunate, the way it works now is um, I have 50% research and 50% clinical appointment. I have a lot of clinical studies running. So essentially, I'm in the lab every day, but a lot of the cases we do are research patients, and lots of things happen, as I'm sure for you, in weekends and nights. Yeah, well, they do. So tell me, you know, the cath lab's evolved a lot over the last 10 years. Uh, the equipment's very different than what we were using a decade ago, even five years. So tell me, what have been the biggest changes that you've seen uh, that mean the most to your CTO practice? So I'm going to focus 
mostly on CTOs in the interview, although I'll, you know, I'll, from time to time I'll drift out and ask you other things about your practice. I think the biggest ones have been the new microcatheters. We have, uh, you know, the Caravel, the Turnpike LP. So the, this has been a big change in the last few years especially. A very big one has been the sex oriented, so the bridge point system, Stingray, Crosspost, this really changed the way we, we practice. That's now five years, you know, six years it's been approved, it's been a long time. And the new wires, I think, are making a big difference now. We have these new um, guide wires that are much more torqueable and um, getting us places we wouldn't be able to get through. So microcatheters, wires, and the reentry system. So that, that raises an interesting question. So y you have a, a lab in a VA system. You have 300 cases a year. Uh, there are financial challenges uh, in any government regulated system. Um, yet, to do CTOs, you have to keep a separate and fairly broad inventory of equipment. How do you manage that financial challenge? Well, it is a challenge, as you say. And uh, the, the solution to this, first of all, they've been very supportive. I think the institution has been very supportive you know, getting us many of those equipment. There are challenges in the system, like every other system. And what the way to, to balance this is by being creative. When you don't have one, then you think of something else that can be used instead. And the reality of it is, even in the most well-equipped labs, sometimes in a case you'll use so many wires you run out of them because it just happens to be a very challenging case. So what we've learned is that we ask for something. If we don't have that, then we ask for something else. But in the CTO field, there isn't a real workhorse. Uh, there are a variety of wires, a variety of microcatheters. Uh, that's a lot of inventory to keep. Uh, I'm sure you have lots of conversations with your cath lab administration. It is and it is not. So the, the wires, actually the wires we use for most CTOs are three types. We use the Filder XT, the Pilot 200, and the Gaius. So it's not as many as you might think. It's not like we have 200. I mean, we have a variety, but the really highly used ones, it's a fairly limited, uh, limited number of equipment. Microcatheters, you know, the Corsair, the Turnpike. So it's not like we have hundreds and hundreds of types of equipment. It's a few types that we need a lot of. Well, great. So with that in mind, what do you think it takes to build a good CTO program? Talk about this for a long time, but I think the main, the main thing is that people are passionate about it. People are excited about it. That's the number one thing. If you don't want to do this, I don't think anyone can, can force but you. That's true for most things. So specific to a CTO program. Well, so, but you know, passion is not the, it's not the flirting passion that goes away. This is like a consistent, this will take time. This doesn't happen, you don't start CTOs today and then in two months you're the world expert. I mean, this will take some time. It takes months, takes years of practice. So I think when I say passion, I mean passion that uh, lasts over time and then the willingness to learn. You're, this is a field that's evolving very rapidly, new things that we can do. So having the passion will let you keep on learning and also will help you absorb the shocks along the way because as, as in the talk, there are going to be failures. I mean, how are going to failures even at any stage in life and complications as well. This can be very painful and um, being able to manage them that's the, and, and move forward and keep on doing this, that's, that's a challenge. Okay, but l let me pin you down a little bit. So I've taken that message. I now go to my chief and say, Chief, I want to start a CTO program. And he says, how are you going to do it? Uh, I can't tell him I'm passionate. I'm passionate. I've got to tell him this is how much time I need. This is, these are the personnel I need. Uh, th this is the support I need. What am I going to tell him? Good question. I think the way we did it, I think the way to do it is not just say, look, I want to do this and I want him to give me all these resources immediately. The way to start is by saying, look, we have this clinical need, which is true. You don't do this just of nowhere. We have these patients that need this procedure done. And if this is done successfully, they're going to benefit. If not, they may actually not only not benefit, but also go somewhere else. So for the administration, a big component of this is that there's a real clinical need. That's going to be good for the patient and for the institution. And instead of asking for big resources up front, I think the solution is 
you start with some basic components and try to do limited numbers early on. Start with the simpler ones so you get good success versus the very complex and everyone gets discouraged and get failures. So start with very simple cases earlier on and then go to the more complicated ones la uh, later as you get more experience and more tools. And I, I think it's more, it's something that people will convert once they see that you can achieve results, which is a, a catch-22 because you don't achieve results early on. That's why starting simple, getting some cases done without any specific, any big uh, commitments and big CTO days and a lot of money and resources, and then slowly so demonstrating you can do it for these simple cases, then slowly building it up, that's probably the better way. Do you have any idea how many CTO operators there are in the U.S. today? There, there are a lot. There are some industry estimates based on proctoring, but uh, the current estimates are at least 50 centers do more than 50 PCIs, CTO PCIs a year or more. And, and the number is, has been growing gr gradually over time. I think there have been actually close to you know, several hundred centers that have been um, proctored over the last few years. Not everyone does it. Some people start and then they decide it's not a good fit for them. But I would say, you know, there's at least you know, 50 or 100 uh, good CTO programs right now in the U.S. And within each program, how many operators are there? If um, the ideal solution is to have two operators that fill in the same wavelength and they can work together. That works well in what, Piedmont, Colombia, so that's the, the best scenario. Otherwise, typically there's a focal person and other people may or may not work with them. But typically, you know, there's obviously one person at least, and in some centers there are two who can work together in those complex cases. Um, so, Manos, um, let's shift gears a little bit from program building to patient selection. We touched on this a bit during Grand Rounds this morning. Tell me how you select patients. Tell me which patients you turn down. Now, you told us diabetics with multivessel disease. That, that's easy to understand. Uh, which other patients do you look at and say, well, I don't think we ought to be doing this procedure? So the, the indications, that's a critical part, as you say, and the indications are the key part of this. And the majority, I would say 90 plus percent of the people who do it for symptoms. So they're ones with medical therapy, they still have significant symptoms and they're going to be fixed. Now we have a little bias here because our program is a lot of referrals. So these are patients who have been tried in other places and they eventually come to us. So it's a little different than the day to day over But still, the patients are the same, that you do it, as I mentioned before, uh, foremost for, for getting symptoms better. Okay, so clinically, symptoms. Now, a lot of symptoms or refractory symptoms or some symptoms? I think this is a patient to decide. So the way I But you've got to decide if you're going to do the case. Well, but the way, I agree, but the way, I would let's say the patient is, is this, like, look, you have the symptoms have this procedure. Success is 90%, complications 3 to 5%. How much are your symptoms and are those bad enough for you to want to go in for this procedure with this particular risk and benefit? If the patient says, the symptoms bother me a lot and I want to be done, that's fine. If they say, look, based on who told me, I think I'm okay the way I am, that's perfectly fine too. So I think it's not, I mean, it's not, we are just the facilitator. I mean, it's not our decision. Our decision is if the patient needs it and he thinks he needs it and he has enough symptoms, then I think we offer it to him. If he's okay with the risks that involve with the procedure. Okay, so you offer it to him if you think it's doable. So if you think that they benefit from the symptoms. And, and if you think it's technically doable. Well, the technical part, we will try anything at this point. Okay, and that's what I'm asking you. Yeah, the, so the technique part, again, the 90% is with non-selection in terms of uh, saying you know, you're angiographically complex. You can tell people, look, you're going to be based on the scores, you're going to be a little more complex, but even in those complex scores, you still get 80% plus success. So even in the most complex, you can s get enough success rates. So right now you're not turning anyone down on technical grounds? We don't turn anyone down. Okay, that, that's important to know. Well, great. Well, Manos, many thanks for uh, coming down to join us today. I wish we could keep you longer. I wish you could proctor us through some cases. I know uh, for you it was uh, a very much sacrifice to be able to break free today, and we very much appreciate that. 
It's my pleasure. It was a wonderful institution. I really enjoyed the questions this morning and our conversation. And again, thank you so much for having me here. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm, I'm really glad you could come down. Well, thank you.